Hi, everybody. I thank Avital for uh, led, lending me his class. You're a captive audience. But we have today a special treat for you. I don't know if you know, but uh, in 2002, a Wall Street journalist, Daniel Pearl, was uh, beheaded by the Taliban uh, because he was in Pakistan trying to do his journalistic uh, work. He was a journalist of the Wall Street Journal, a very ethical journalist. And uh, as I said, he, was, he went to interview uh, one of the leaders of the Taliban, and they captured him and beheaded him. He was really the first journalist uh, that was beheaded. This, this year, a graduate of IDC, Steven Stotloff, uh, also was captured by ISIS and also, unfortunately, was beheaded. Uh, today, we are very fortunate, in a few minutes, uh, the journalist, Astra Numeni, uh, who lived in Pakistan. She's a Muslim journalist from Wall Street Journal. Uh, in her house, Daniel and his wife, Marian, lived in her house. Uh, and from there, he went to interview uh, the, the Taliban leader from which he didn't return. Asra then studied and researched uh, for many years this whole story about the beheading of journalists, international journalists. And she's very close to the family. And today she's in, in Israel. She's in a symposium in Jerusalem. And we invited her to, to speak to you about her experience with Daniel. But uh, she will be here in a few minutes. We want to show you uh, a clip that is a part of our website. I'm the chair of the Daniel Pearl Journalism Institute. So today you will see a clip about Daniel and very briefly show the story of Daniel. And then we'll show you a small clip. You know, this is, by the way, Rona. Rona Zahavi, I don't know if you, you met her, but she's in, in charge of uh, our international radio program in IDC, in the School of Communication. She's also part of the Daniel Pearl in Journalism Institute. I will show you later a trailer. There was a movie, The Mighty Heart, in which Angelina Julie played Mary and Daniel's wife. Uh, so we show the trailer, and then, then Asra will be able to tell you more about it, because it was in her house that the whole, the, whole, the whole event took place. So first, I would like to show you the short clip about Daniel Pearl and his story. In a place where growing terrorism threatens to silence freedom. In a place where extremism and hatred rule. In a place where violence is the language spoken and humanity is oppressed. The media's role is more crucial than ever. American people are deeply saddened to learn about the loss of Daniel Pearl's life. Daniel Pearl, the Wall Street Journal reporter, paid with his life for his tolerance, quest for justice, dignity, and honesty. To me, Danny's truth lies in the way he lived his life, not in the way he died. This is his own victory, that his spirit remained untouched and that his life wasn't hijacked by his death. In January 2002, Daniel was kidnapped by fundamentalist Muslims from the Al-Qaeda organization in Pakistan and was cruelly executed. The death of, the, of Daniel Pearl was a um, was real thunderstorm for all journalists in the world. The terror tried to kill the values, but the opposite result was achieved a recognition of the need for better journalism, one which would be more influential in deciding the course for the bleeding Middle East. Courage in journalism has a lot to do with ethics and with, you know, maintaining your ethics even though, uh, you know, there's reasons to have an opinion yourself and, you know, and, and it requires so much from you as a person. Now, more than ever, the question arises, what is the journalist's role? Once you understand that your role is not to take sides, but to try to just convey what's happening so that the viewer or the reader can get a sense, which is important, especially in a democratic society. 
People need to understand everything that's happening to make the proper decisions. A good journalist is somebody who, who arrives in a situation with preconceived ideas, but who allows the wind of history, the storm of event, the anger of facts to overwhelm his preconceived ideas. The death of Daniel Pearl prompted his parents, Ruth and Judea, to commemorate his mission and establish, in cooperation with the School of Communications, IDC Herzliya Israel, the International Journalism Institute in the spirit of Daniel Pearl's legacy of ethical journalism. The goal is to teach the world how to cover conflict areas in a balanced way, without fears or prejudices. I feel this is uh, an accomplishment, culmination of many nights of dreams and many hopes. We really wanted to bring it to Israel and we really wanted to bring it to uh, a dignified, institutionalized uh, organization that will perpetuate Dani's uh, legacy. Information can kill. And in a place where a single word can change reality, whoever holds information can turn it into a dangerous weapon. Responsible journalism is no longer an option. It is a necessity. The Middle East is craving for an in-depth coverage of the core issues that will shape the destiny of the region. The Daniel Pearl International Journalism Institute aims to address this challenge by providing for the first time an academically based knowledge and region-specific training for such coverage to emerge and a unique think tank for the international community of journalists. We are creating this institute in order to enrich foreign journalists who come to cover the Middle East and cover both sides, not just the Israelis, but also the Palestinians. And we wish this new institute of ours to provide them with in-depth know-how and understanding of the culture of the Middle East. And we trust and believe that the more they understand the cultures, the deeper and more serious will be the coverage of the stories here. And we believe that deep understanding increases the chances of peace. The programs of the Institute International Journalism Summit, Journalism Award, Immersion Program in the Region, the Eyewitness Series Panel Discussions. Maybe one beautiful day, with the help of courageous journalism, we'll find a way to live in peace and friendship. If the Daniel Pearl Institute will help even a little bit to uh, come closer to such a day, it is worth of, our, of all our efforts. I, want to, I told you about uh, Aslan Mani, about the background, and we're very happy that you came from Jerusalem yeah. just to address our students with your son. What's the name of your son? Shibli. Shibli. Oh, thank you. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thank you so much. So, thank you so much for coming. I, I think you don't have to be here, right? They have to be here. Your first years, right? So you're going to even love it more and more and more because it's going to mean that you're going to be a great troublemaker in the world. You're going to take really good notes. And uh, there's nobody who's going to be able to think faster than you, except for your fellow friends. And then they're going to be very annoying, and you're going to keep each other on your toes. Because that's the other reason why I love being here, is because this institute of journalism that you are at is named for this great dear friend of mine who kept me on my toes always. Danny Pearl. How old are all of you? 22. So what? 1990. So we've got what, high five for what? 89? 89 is the oldest, oldest right now? 84. Okay. Um, 84. Anyone can do better than 84? 64? 
<laughs> Nobody's older than me. Um, 84 is the best we've got then? Okay, so 84. 84 is a perfect year. That was the year then that was probably the common year that Danny and I were both in college. Probably the time when you were, we were equal to where you are at in your life. And Danny was in, at Stanford University. I was at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia, which is famous for burning couches after football victories, which is always a success with the local police chief. Yeah, they, w whether they win or lose, they burn couches. So what we did, Danny and I, was we both worked in journalism when we were in college. We both made sure that when we were even studying journalism, we were doing journalism. I was uh, doing big investigations like the fact that the men's bathroom in the 1980s in Morgantown, West Virginia, was the place where gay men would secretly have their rendezvous. And this was, <laughs> I know, I'm looking at you, you're nodding your head. You're, such, you're like, she's not talking about me, okay? I don't know what. You're just, you're a good listener. You're, he learned, he learned to have very good effect. A poor thing, the wrong, I should have brought something else up. How they exploited international students in the cafeteria. You nod your head at that, that way, yeah, yes. They exploited, you know, because the foreign students were coming and they got a cheaper wage than the American students. So those were the kind of exposés that I did. And then Danny on his side was going across um, and interviewing Soviet Jews who were trying to find their new identity. And so this was how we were all both beginning. And we ended up crossing paths in the summer of 1993. So I know there were some people who were just born the summer of 1993. That was when our friendship began. We were both, by that time, young reporters at the Wall Street Journal in Washington, DC. And Danny was the best friend I could have ever imagined. He was the guy who basically made sure that I learned how to drink beer, which was a very big cultural lesson for a good Muslim girl from India. I had told him that all I had ever drank in my life was um, something called Bartles and James wine coolers. Does anybody know what those are? Nodding your head. It's sort of like juice, but with a little bit of alcohol in it. You're not listening right now, Shibley. So Danny was the one who made sure that I got to know the bar scene in Washington, DC. And so we would go to this place called The Big Hunt. We would complain about our editors. Do you know The Big Hunt? <laughs> she knows The Big Hunt. She goes to the best bars in Washington. <laughs> it's the cheesiest, diviest bar. You don't want the lights turned on. It's, it's very ugly in there. But we would, by evening, go after work to the bar at, the, at DuPont Circle. On the weekends, we played beach volleyball behind the Lincoln Memorial in DC, where there's dirt sand courts. So this is. This is just an innocent life. I mean, it's a life probably not much unlike many of yours. You know, a, a life in which we worked really hard and then we also tried to have fun. Um, every girl that I knew had a crush on Danny. And I was the one they would come crying to because he wouldn't call back. Or he didn't ask, yes, I know. <laughs> or he wouldn't ask them out for a second date. And I would have to be on the phone with them, because we still used receiver phones back then. And 
I would explain to them, oh, he's just really picky, and you know, he's a really nice guy. You'll be great friends. And then one day, he told me a few years later that he'd met this great woman that he had fallen in love with, Marianne Pearl, who he ended up, Marianne Van Nienhoff, who you watched a little bit in the movie also, who he ended up marrying. And I was proud to take uh, balloons from uh, America to their wedding in Paris so that they could have a great picnic the day after because I was the American picnic party planner for their wedding. And I, I'm just telling you all of these stories because the rest, of, the rest of the story becomes so dark and so horrible um, related to all of that which happened after September 11th. As a journalist, Danny went to Pakistan. I went to Pakistan. His wife, Marianne, was with him. And you all could see in the movie clip that she was a few months pregnant when they both came to this home that I was renting in Karachi, Pakistan. And I had thought that I was going to write my great American novel sitting in this villa in Karachi. But it ended up that this home became the scene for this nightmare that I could never even imagine. And it was on that day, on January 23rd, that Danny went off for an interview. I just thought about it, you know, as I was in the cab coming from Jerusalem. Because did I know the cab driver? Didn't know him. He said IDC had sent him, you know. I trusted, I got into the cab with my son, and we're here, safe and sound, and that's what we do as journalists. We end up in cabs, and we go, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And what happened that day changed the universe for journalists. That day then, as you all know, Danny didn't come back. The five weeks that are documented in that movie, Mighty Heart, are about the five weeks that we tried to find Danny. When I was um, at the New York Bureau of the Wall Street Journal, I did a really fun story on this industry called tantric sex. I'm sure none of you have heard of it. Um, it's this ancient Indian philosophy. Ah, oh, she's smiling. Uh, <laughs> Basically, I wrote a story about the big business of selling tantric sex in America. And I was trying to find Mr. Tantra and Mrs. Tantra and all of the teachers along the way. And so I developed this system of creating a family tree, basically doing mind mapping, but with a family tree of all of the teachers and students. And it got really weird because then students were sleeping with teachers and teachers were sleeping with students. And I would have basically, you know, straight lines for the places where people were sleeping with each other and then dashed lines where they weren't because it was so confusing. And that's what I used then as my system for mapping on the wall of my dining room in Karachi all of the suspects that we thought were involved in Danny's kidnapping and murder. That's what gets chronicled in the movie also as this map that sort of illustrates this investigation that unfolded over the next weeks. I thought all along that the worst that would happen was that Danny would just be kidnapped and that would be it. The worst that we had heard until that year was the story of Terry Anderson. Do any of you know that name at all? Yeah, just across the border then in Lebanon, he was kidnapped in the 80s, right? I was just a student then, Danny was just a student. It was off the streets of Beirut that he was kidnapped and he was held hostage. I think his beard got a little bit longer than yours, just, but just as white. And he emerged a completely different man. And so in the fifth week of trying to find Danny, I turned to Marianne and I said, you know, just be prepared that we may wait years for Danny to come back. And then that was 
the night that all of a sudden all the men disappeared. All the men who kept coming through the house to try to help us find Danny, they all disappeared. None of them answered their cell phones and none of them would even, uh, they turned their phones off and then all of a sudden they emerged at the door and the, the chief of um, the investigation, this guy that we named Captain, he turned to Marianne and he said, I'm sorry, I couldn't bring your Danny home. And that's when our universe just completely changed. That, that guy that had taken me to the big hunt, you know, he'd helped me have my high school prom that I never went to as a Muslim girl. He, he threw one for me at the age of 28. I finally had my high school prom. And that guy did not, they said he didn't come back. And that is the new reality. That is the Institute of Journalism for which uh, you are now, you're sitting here under this institute named for Danny, this man who went out just as I just got into a taxi this afternoon to speak to you. He got into a taxi and none of us ever are thinking that we're risking our lives. We don't think that we're going to endanger our futures, that people will cry for us, that memorials will be named for any of us. That's Danny right there. He's like, it's getting too serious. You need to get, you need to lighten it up. Um, Cause all I wanted to do when Danny came back was tell him about how I'd gone through all his emails and read every single one of them and uh, how I was sure that there was this one shoe that he had lost and he had thought that I had stolen it and I want a pair of Nike shoes that he'd bought to play volleyball one of the weekends when we had been hanging out in Karachi together. I had all this stuff that I wanted to say. I wanted to just give him a hard time, which is not a really nice thing to plan to do to somebody who's just been kidnapped, right? But you try to do whatever you can in the midst of this darkness to figure out what you're going to see at the end of it all. The last thing that any of us expected was more darkness. And I look out at all of you and I know that, you know, your, your lives began, you were such children in the midst of all of this and you're the future. You are truly the future for everything that Danny believed in, for every inch of curiosity, every ounce of hope that he had. I mean, he was a great guy and every little bit of goodness that you have in you, every little bit of, of morality that drives you to want to make this world a better place is a reflection of the spirit with which he lived. I mean, anything that you tap as you move forward in your lives, you know, whether you stay within the profession of journalism or you just take these skills to do other activities, other jobs, whether you, you know, just become a, um, a thorn on the side of some city council somewhere or, uh, you know, a parent teacher association or the medical school board, anything that you do to just help improve this world just a little bit would be the legacy that Danny would have wished in this world. That's, that's, what it, that's what Danny's death meant for me. You know, until then, you saw the um, articles that I was doing. I was sort of the um, informal sex reporter at the Wall Street Journal, which is a very interesting job, right? Trying to, but it's a big multi-billion dollar industry, right? <laughs> And, and it was fun, it was interesting, um, but it wasn't this reality that we also know in this world. And for me, Danny's murder became the moment that I realized that I wanted to stand up as a writer. 
against the expression of extremism inside the faith in which I was born, in Islam. And I, you all know the word jihad. Many of you might know the word khalam, which is, do you know that, what that word means? Khalam. It means pen. It means a pen in Arabic. And so what I, um, what I chose for myself, or maybe it chose, this path was just chosen for me then through the destiny of, of waving goodbye to Danny that day and having him as a friend was a path over this last 13 years now it's been since Danny's murder of a jihad bil khalam. Uh, against issues of extremism within Islam, against issues of sexism, absence of women's rights, absence of tolerance. Um, it's made me very popular, as you can imagine, in my own community. Uh, the men at my local mosque back in West Virginia, you know, didn't like it when I decided I would go into the main hall instead of this balcony that was reserved for the women. They didn't like it when I challenged their sermons. And what were their sermons preaching? Their sermons were preaching that the Jews were on a dark path, as were the Christians. And when the imam at my mosque said that the Jews are on a dark path, who do you think I saw? Who do you think? Danny. That's right. I saw Danny's face and I'm like, this is the guy who took me to the big hunt. It might be dark in there, but he's not on the dark path. You know, I, I knew a reality that was much different what, than what was being preached at the mosque. And, you know, that's why I came to Jerusalem is in part because of this kind of reporting and this writing that I'm doing. My son Shibli has a first name from our ancestry. I think, I don't know if any of you have gone, but I've heard that there's a Bedouin village north of here by that name, that if we can manage to do a road trip in the next 48 hours, we'll get there. But I gave Shibli a, as a middle name, the name of Daniil from Danny's name. And you know, it was a necessary and important for me because it means God is the judge and so whether you believe in God or not the idea that human beings aren't here to judge each other you know in acts of morality or value of life is what was important and critical to me and so we don't know like right now at your wonderful young ages I hope that you will not see a January 23rd, 2002 in your own life, but I do know also that you are on the front lines of war right here. And while you are right now in the safe space of, of your lives right now as students, I know that you have, many of you have probably absorbed great traumas or great, um, great exposure to this conflict in which the state of Israel also finds itself. I don't know if you're going to become food writers, you know, or war correspondents, but in whatever you do, I hope that you will just carry the light. Just you know, really value the light that is within you and carry it. You are studying at an institute named for a really great guy. A, a, the kind of person that you would have wanted to hang out with. You would have wanted to spend, you know, share a beer with him at the big hunt. He would hang out at Madam's organ, right? Up the street, playing his violin. He didn't become a concert, um, an orchid, whatever, because I don't even know that, that life, the world of music. He's the one who exposed me to it. He didn't become a professional violinist, but he knew how to have great, um, open mic nights and he knew how to have fun and so I hope you'll carry that light and I hope that you will also enjoy this life because that's what I learned the most over these last 13 years I spent most of them investigating every detail of Danny's murder so I lived 
for a decade on the, in the five days of the captivity that then led to his murder. And then it took me a trip to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba to realize that all this chase of the details of Danny's murder was not never going to bring Danny back. And so a smart man said to me that grieving means to actually live life fully. And so that is in part, you know, what I realized Danny's message to me was also, as I knew him as a friend, he taught me how to live life fully, how to have fun in this world. So while you carry the light, please continue to have fun. Please continue to enjoy your lives and to see the light also around you so that you can be living testimony to all that's good in this world. So I would love, I want to thank you first for listening to me so intently. And I would, I would love to be in conversation with you. Any questions that you have? And we can just let them speak? OK, thank you. Yes, the oldest guy in the room gets the. What is your last talk? What was my last? Yeah, before you left. So the, what was my last correspondence with Danny? And you know, when you asked me the question, I just thought about the last text message that I got from Danny was uh, three days before he came to my house, he and Marianne went to get a sonogram for his baby. And they discovered, so he wrote to me, it's a boy. And I wrote back to him, uh, Ibn Pearl, son of Pearl. And my last correspondence with him was literally a wave goodbye as he went off in this taxi. And my last words to him were just, see you later, Danny. Um, I didn't know this, the details of his investigation because we're not really good at sharing information as journalists, which is something we should learn to do better. But it was, it was the chatter of friends, really. Yeah. How do you think journalism has been affected or changed by those So she asked, how has journalism been changed or affected by Danny's murder? I think two things have happened. I think that, you know, journalists have a target on their backs. Journalists are uh, afraid. And journalists are um, not taking as many risks. And that's, to me, that's not good for our world. And we can see from the way the Islamic State is behaving that it's considered free reign now to target journalists. And you know, I, that's why I wanted to investigate every detail of Danny's murder is because too often now journalists are dying with this word of uh, impunity, which means that nobody gets charged, right? And they're getting away. People are literally getting away with murder. And so this is, I think, also part of our task. I hope all of you will join organizations like Committee to Protect Journalists or Reporters Without Borders. The investigative reporters, um, uh, investigative reporters and editors in America. I'm sure you have groups here in Israel too. But please join these organizations, even as students, to basically support the industry and to support your future. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel when you come here to Israel and like you say the words that you are saying and like somehow you go um and you create a controversial uh, the place where you came from? How do I feel coming here and what was the second part you said? All the words that you said like about Daniel and about um the things that you were getting to know that you didn't know before. Yeah. Um, and and the, and and getting to know Danny, right? And and then she was asking, and then I can't go. Sometimes I can't go against the things that I come from. Um, am I afraid? Well, 
on the drive over, I tried to call um, Danny's aunt because I'd like to see her in Tel Aviv. And one of the um, streets in Tel Aviv, I think it is, is named for one of Danny's ancestors. He talks about it in his murder video when he's, they have him, or he says, I am Jewish, my mother is Jewish, my father is Jewish, and he chronicles how one of his great-grandparents has a street named for him here in Israel. And I want to go in those footsteps because I do feel, uh, I, I feel, I feel very moved being here. And I also feel this great um, complexity because the truth is that there are a lot of people who would like to see Israel gone. And as I drove here and I saw the construction, I saw the um, train tracks, right, that they're building here and there, this bridge, the homes, I just thought to myself, like, how can that be a political reality? So I want to also invite you all, if there is an enterprising investigative journalist among you, I have a project that I'm working on that I um, will talk to your teachers about. But I'd like to find partners in you all. At Georgetown University, we started what we call the Pearl Project, which was named for Danny, and we investigated. We only knew at the beginning that there were four people who were charged with Danny's murder and convicted. By the, end of our uh, by the end of our investigation, which took years, we established that there were 27 people involved. So what's the math, 27 minus four? 23, right? 23 people who were never charged in Danny's murder. So now I'm doing an investigation in which I'm trying to find the identities of people who are basically trying to silence people like myself who are talking about issues of extremism in Islam. And the one theme that I'm noticing consistently is that they have a very anti-Israel message. But thank you all of you. Thank you.